Good afternoon, and you're very welcome to today's webinar, which is uh, Social Work and Coronavirus, Staying Connected in Crisis. I'm Avery Bowser, I'm co-chair of the Belfast Local Engagement Partnership, and I'll be facilitating today's webinar. I should also say that I'm a Children's Services Manager for Action for Children in Northern Ireland, and I'm responsible for our fostering service. Uh, I'm also very proud to say that I'm a BASWA member. Um, so also at the outset, I should say that we're recording this webinar. So again, it'll be available for others who weren't able to be here today. Um, we want to look at the impact of COVID-19 on social work, social workers and service users. We'll be hearing from service users and social workers, and hopefully from you uh, through the, your questions as the webinar proceeds. Um, when you entered the webinar, you should have seen a control panel, which has a, a questions or chat option for you to submit your comments and questions as we go along. Um, if it's not visible, you should see an orange box with a white arrow. If you click on that, it should open the control panel and you'll, you'll see the chat questions option. Um, you should also notice in there that there's a handout box, which contains a lot of additional material to support today's webinar. And I'd encourage you to take a look at that. Today's webinar has been made possible through a partnership uh, between BASWA Northern Ireland and the Belfast Local Engagement Partnership. BASWA is the UK professional association for social workers and social work. Today's webinar fits perfectly with BASWA's digital learning offer and the support to social workers during COVID-19. The Belfast Local Engagement Partnership is one of five groups, each covering the area of one of the five health and social care trusts in Northern Ireland. The local engagement partnerships are part of the social work strategy for Northern Ireland. The first phase of that strategy was at leadership level and a regional level, promoting social work through the media and wider public engagement, as well as work on social work infrastructure. The engagement partnerships were an initiative to bring that work nearer to practice. In Belfast, we're an open membership group of social workers and service users who come together to promote and improve social work. Co-production is key to what we do and is reflected in our steering group and the co-chairing by myself and Dave Milliken. Um, over the last three years, we've operated through a series of workshops. These are focused on co-production, adult social care, measuring social work, the needs of older people, um, particularly those from ethnic minority communities. Our last workshop in January focused on poverty, and this month we'd hope to follow up from the success of that workshop by looking at community development. But then, as for all of us, the, the pandemic intervened. So we talked with each other. We agreed to see if, like the rest of the world, we could continue to work online like this, as many of you are familiar with. And we agreed to tackle the topic of the day, COVID-19 which brings us neatly to what will be happening next. In a couple of minutes, you'll hear three five-minute presentations from Dave Milliken, who'll bring a service user perspective, Greta Thompson, who will talk about social work with older people in a community organization, and Eamon Macrolane, who will talk to us about hospital social work during the pandemic. After that, we'll form a panel with Martina Jordan from Baswa Northern Ireland and Mandy Cowden from the Social Care Council. So again, please submit your questions and thoughts as we proceed, because we want to drive our panel discussion. Keep an eye on the chat box, because sometimes great conversations get started there. And don't forget uh, the resource in the handout box that will tell you more about what BASWA, the Social Care Council and Action for Children have been doing during the crisis. I asked our speakers to focus on the challenges during the pandemic, but also to identify the successes, the things that have worked what they've learnt, including the things we might want to keep or change in the future. And I've asked them if they have any thoughts about how we might emerge during lockdown. And again, that's something I'd like to encourage you all to think about during the webinar, and I hope that'll come out in our, our later conversation. So before we begin, I do want to say a few thank yous. This is a, is a work of co-production, and I'm, by that I mean social workers and service users working together but it's also a product of organisational partnership, which is very symbolic of the times we're in. This wouldn't have been possible without colleagues in Baswa Northern Ireland and the support of Baswa UK. I also want to thank Claire, Action for Children, 
Belfast Health <coughs> and Social Care Trust and the Social Care Council in Northern Ireland for supporting this event. Uh, before I ask Dave to contribute, uh, I want to show you a short video by one of our steering group members, Denise Withers. Uh, our original plan had been that Denise and Dave would have made the first presentation on service user issues. Denise has been shielding now for 10 weeks. Uh, Pre-COVID-19, there were more than enough challenges for us um, getting Denise involved with, with our steering group and other activities through things like carer timings, PA support, transport and communication. The isolation of COVID-19 has made that impossible, but as I'm sure you'll hear today, has highlighted how relatively straightforward IT and communication assistance could dramatically change the ability of many people to contribute and participate, even when we get back into so-called normal times. One of the outcomes of our local engagement partnership is that Denise started volunteering with Action for Children. She completed work on e-learning materials for disability awareness and access with my HR colleague, Jane Hamilton. Denise was nominated for a diversity award in Action for Children, and this is the film that introduced her at the awards ceremony at the end of February. So if we could have that video now, that would be great. I nominated Denise for the Walter Tull Award because she's taught me so much about inclusion and made me question how and why we do things, and I wanted to recognise her contribution. The first time I met Denise was when she came along to one of our leadership team meetings. She came to the meeting, prepared what she wanted to say, and she shared a video that she'd made about some of the communication difficulties that she has. The thing that struck me throughout my time working with it is really Denise's determination. She really keeps me on task. She's very focused on what we're doing. She's very organised and really wants to get things done. It means a lot to be nominated and thank you. I got involved with Action for Children because I wanted to volunteer. The best thing has been getting down to work and making people think about how to communicate and help them understand the challenges for someone like me. Inclusion is very important because it's about how to think about everyone and not just walking away. From the age of five it's been about what I can't do rather than what I can do. It has opened up my eyes how Action for Children approach things. You don't walk away, you keep going, you don't give up. She really wants to give back and contribute to the world around her and I really admire that. It's great fun working with Denise. We have a lot of laughs together, so it's, it's been very enjoyable. If anyone is thinking of volunteering for Action for Children, go for it. And don't let anyone stop you or you will regret it. Okay, so welcome back. Um, at this point, I would have been handing over to uh, my colleague, uh, Dave Milliken, um, who is also the co-chair of Belfast Local Engagement Partnership. Unfortunately, due to a combination of health and broadband issues, Dave can't be with us today. Um, it's a great pity because the chairing of the Belfast Partnership is properly a joint enterprise between us, and this wouldn't be happening without his ideas and his work. Um, there's a number of people on this call who know Dave and he's a formidable voice for service users, totally committed to co-production and passionate about learning. And I'm always proud to call him a colleague. Um, he was able to however, to record this presentation, which we're going to play for you now. So, um, hello everyone, thank you very much for that introduction, Avery. It's lovely to not see you today. Um, as Avery suggested, my name is Dave, and um, I'm going to give us a bit of a perspective from the service user. Now, we had we had planned on trying to get a, have an interview with a particular service user who was having some particular problems. Unfortunately, technology has failed us, and anyone who's been using Zoom or whatever will know that putting these things together are an absolute nightmare. So our hats off to our friends in Basel UK putting this together and making it all so smooth. Um, so what I did was I reached out over Twitter and through email and through Facebook and I asked people who, uh, who have um, physical and mental health challenges uh, to kind of send me things that they would find particularly difficult. And I got them to put them together and I gathered them all together and I put them into a presentation. So if we could go to the first slide, that'd be good. Oh, so, 
So there's a there's me and Denise. Uh, Denise was meant to be our star of the show. She's not, so she'll be absolutely raging. So uh, we'll have to keep this keep this uh, keep this quick so her rage doesn't become palpable. Right. So if we just move to the next uh, next slide, of that great. Thank you. So we talked about a few things, um, and some of the things coming through were really difficulties that were practical. In fact, all of the difficulties were mainly practical. Um, but things like going to the shop uh, just became this mammoth, almost feeling insurmountable task. Uh, being able to establish social distancing, if anyone's been to the shop, you'll know that people seem to take it as a suggestion rather than a um, rather than a uh, a rule. Um, getting help, getting help from staff was a challenge because some people were afraid to ask because they didn't want to put the staff member in in uh, uh, in danger if they had the virus, and obviously they were concerned for themselves because they were concerned that the, that the sub shooter, the uh, staff member, had the virus and was asymptomatic. Uh, once again, paying for goods, dealing with cash was a nightmare and not everybody uses chip and pin some people still use the old cash system and sticking with the cash theme we had access in atms atms were a challenge um with the danger of obviously feeling that they haven't touched things and, and increased levels of anxiety across the board for those with not just those with physical disabilities but with those with mental health challenges and, and learning disabilities as well um this one was a big one electric and gas ran out very very quickly and I actually heard some very amusing stories of conversations with gas and electric companies who, um, when people were asking if they could go on a contract, just pay up front contract, just for a little bit to get them through this time. And those companies weren't, certainly weren't very sympathetic. And final, and another big issue, especially for those receiving direct payments, is um, personal assistance may choose to self-isolate. And I say those words very carefully, I use the word choose very carefully, um, because obviously they're not choosing, they're doing it for, for everyone's benefit, but I think in some cases it really did feel that um, it was, it, it, well, it was, it was obviously being taken quite personally and, um, and people felt really, really isolated and alone by that. So just moving on to the next slide. Um, People were finding it a massive challenge of having no interaction for very long periods of time. And these aren't necessarily people who have um, massive health challenges uh, or, you know, uh, who need help out of bed or anything like that. Sometimes it's just having a conversation. Zoom is great for that. Um, other technologies are good for that. Not everybody has internet access. Not everybody has a smartphone. And we're finding people who have maybe been isolating for 80 days. and have, you know, maybe the most I've seen is somebody once a week for a window. So a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety, and a lot of feeling of, of loneliness. And I had the word um, empty used on one occasion, so I was just feeling completely empty. Um, and then obviously feeling like a burden to family and friends, which was, um, once again, uh, a big challenge. And this came from, ev from virtually everybody who, who I spoke to they felt that they were leaning heavily on family and friends even more. And there was obviously a bit of guilt that came with that. Further disruption to personal care schedules. Trying to get your schedule down to a T is a challenge enough. And then to have that completely disrupted and your personal care not happen when you need it to happen or when you're used to it to happen. But more importantly, when it's important that it happens, so for example, changing a catheter device and the like, you know, a real kind of, um, uh, there's a real sh bit of a real shock to the system and uh, people are really struggling to kind of, um, to kind of cope with that and to find and be innovative, to find ways around it. And finally, you know, missing visits to and visits from family and friends. Uh, I think I, uh, getting, getting out and about is great, but usually you can cope with it if, You've got people coming in and um, you know having a bit of a chat and, and that sort of thing. Um, for a lot of people, that's just not happening anymore. And for a lot of people, they're just not getting out of the house either. And that's a that's that's a massive challenge. I'm sorry to just kind of present all of the negatives. There have been some positives. So uh, just to finish with some positives, 
one of the massive things that have happened is that for a lot of people, the community spirit, especially with people being furloughed and off work, um, the community spirit where they have had extra time in their hands and they have been able to reach out and help their neighbours. But unfortunately, that as people get back to work, that's not going to be able to continue. So we have that continued anxiety as well. So, so anxiety is the word of the day, I think. And um, but uh, but it's great that that there has been that kind of community support as well. And that's that's really all I have to say on that. Really. So keep all your difficult questions to the end. I've just been uh, chatting with my colleagues offline here, and it was like having him having him here in person. It was uncanny. Um, actually, another just before I go to the next presentation, uh, again, uh, when we started on this journey with this webinar, the things that's kind of happened, you know, and the dynamic of getting people to talk. Um, I'd really like to. It's a bit of a shout out here and a thank you to Ian Stafford, who's been in touch with uh, Dave and myself on the back of this from a service user perspective, and sent me a lovely email with lots of kind of experiences, some of his own collect collated from other service users and again you know not wishing to go for the negative but it is saying some of the issues that were out there particularly on sort of domiciliary care you know about the PPE as we all know wasn't available right away but also two interesting perspectives you know one saying well look some some service users weren't really playing ball here you know in terms of socially distancing and that created problems but on the other side you know people having experiences of you know their care workers not wearing masks and that being a problem we had an interesting discussion before we came on here about the issue of masks and as it relates to communication difficulties and all the issues that that has thrown up and and again i think very very usefully um ian kind of threw out the kind of scenario you know if this had, if this had happened in the winter um you know how much greater would the challenges have been for us you know in terms of social distancing not able to get to people in rural areas and i think as dave was highlighting again at the start highlighted the issue for denise about you know, IT connection and all that. And I think those are really big issues for us going forward. So again, as we go through here, I'd encourage you all who are listening in on this to have a have a think about those issues and maybe reflect that in, in the chat box as we go. So uh, could I turn to uh, Greta Thompson? Uh, very pleased that Greta's with us today. Greta's operations manager with Claire CIC, which is a community-based voluntary organization that supports socially socially isolated older people in North Belfast. They do that through combined social work and uh, community asset-based approaches. She's been a practicing social worker for 22 years and worked in the statutory sector as both a social worker and senior social worker over a 19-year period before moving to Clare in 2017. So, uh, Greta, over to you. Hi, everybody. Um, I hope everybody can hear me okay. As Avery said, my name is Greta Thompson. And I'm here just to give you really some insights into the challenges and successes that we've experienced as a social work team in a community organisational setting since COVID and the lockdown began a few weeks ago. Um, if we could move on to the first slide, that would be great, please. The first uh, challenge that we faced was really a practical one. Um, we're a small organization and we had to really um, look at how we could facilitate relocating staff to allow for remote working at home. We're based in a community center, so we had to look at alternatives in terms of keeping our staff safe, as well as being able to provide the support and service that we um, were running. Now, we're not a big organization and I know from the statutory sector and haven't been there for a long time, they have an IT department. That doesn't happen in voluntary and community organizations. So we really had to be on the ground funding and um, sourcing laptops for staff, sourcing IT infrastructure, sourcing a telephone um, network that would allow us to keep in contact with our older people and for them to phone us as well. So really in a, in a community setting and in a voluntary organizational setting, it's all hands on deck, whether you're the social worker or the operations manager or the health and wellbeing officer. The second challenge that we faced was around duplication of responses from community and statutory organizations and services on the ground. There were a lot of pop-up community um, 
organizations that were being set up very quickly. And when I say, you know, pop-up organizations, I'm talking maybe about churches or sports organizations or even street to street um, uh, residents associations who were popping up very quickly to respond to the need of the older people that they were coming across. And that manifested itself in things like food parcels or shopping or providing hot meals. Now, it was a uh, an asset to us because we were able to link into those things that were happening very quickly um, and refer some of our older people in to get some of those services. But it was also a challenge because they were set up very quickly and there didn't seem to be anybody really coordinating them. So the feedback we were getting from our older people was that they were being inundated with food parcels or they were getting food that they couldn't eat or they were getting food that they found out of date. So they were phoning us to say, is there anybody you know that could benefit from this because we can't really use it at the minute? The second um, challenge was around um, maintaining our links with our colleagues in the larger voluntary organisations and the statutory sectors. We have a very good relationship with the two social services offices that are based in North Belfast where we are um, operating. Um, and if we have clients in common, we would be phoning back and forward um, about their needs and, and how we were finding things and, and so on. However, that changed because like us, they were responding to the emergency situation that was unfolding and staff were becoming um, remote in terms of they were working from home. So the communication has actually decreased a bit um, because over the emergency period, things just changed rapidly. Another um, challenge, which is very, um, close to our hearts is we pride ourselves on being very um, person centered and you know we help people get to health appointments and GP appointments we have volunteers that will go into older people's houses and provide social activities and um, social support for them that stopped you know we couldn't provide the face-to-face -face contact with service users that we wanted to and, and what we were used to doing um, so we had to really look at the impact on the relationships that was having with our volunteers, with our staff and with our, our older people. Now, obviously, we were, you know, like most people, we responded by making phone calls, but you do lose a lot over the phone trying to uh, interact with people. You know, you, you're not able to see the non verbals You're not able to notice if somebody is unkempt. You're not able to notice if somebody's thinner because they're not eating properly, for example. So as a social worker, that was kind of a challenge for us to be a bit more probing in our questions. And we were frightened that we would miss something over the phone. And apart from that, people sometimes aren't comfortable talking on the phone because they're more used to that face-to-face -face contact. And if you're an older person with hearing difficulties, that can actually be another added challenge to overcome on the phone. So we had to be really, um, innovative and creative in looking and, and rethinking how we provided our service and what interventions we were going to respond with that were creative to address the needs that we were being faced with. The final challenge that I wanted to talk about, and nobody likes to talk about the F word, but the funding is an issue for voluntary and, and charitable organisations. Um, and in the midst of this, um, when lockdown happened at the start of March, we had two staff who were only going to be funded until the end of March, one of which was our social worker. Um, so we had to, in the midst of all the emergency responses um, and addressing needs and supporting people, I had to apply for funding, I had to negotiate funding, and I had to write monitoring reports for funding that was already given. That's quite a stressful situation in the midst of everything else that's going on. But it hasn't always been doom and gloom. The past few weeks have been a huge learning curve. Um, and I have to say that the things that have worked well for us have been around adapting and adapting quickly to ways to provide support for the older people that we, you know, we look after. Um, and we've done that in a practical way by being person centered. And I, I've brought that back to uh, what is one of the core values of the Clare project. We recognized, as I said earlier on, that a lot of older people were getting their, their practical needs around food um, and the basic needs met. But what we were hearing from people was, yes, food wasn't a problem, but they needed other things. So we decided we would respond in a personalized way by doing personalized shopping for people. For example, people were phoning in saying, I, I can't get access to wipes to look after my stoma bag, or I need pads, or I need toiletries, or actually on one occasion, I need pineapple jam. Who knew? Um, but those kind of, those kind of, um, 
requests were really good in keeping us focused on what people needed and what they were finding difficulties with. So we have staff and volunteers on a weekly basis who go out on a Wednesday and a Friday and respond to those personal requests. The people will phone in what they need and we'll we'll get them delivered to their door. And um, sorry, if we go on to the successes, yeah, that actually leads to another aspect, which is face-to-face -face social contact. Although we can't do a lot of face-to-face -face contact over the phone, doing the personalised shopping has given us another way to get to people and provide that support. So when volunteers and staff are delivering the groceries, they can stay there for 20 minutes, half an hour, and chat to people over their gate within social distancing rules, obviously, but maintain that social contact that is so vital to our older people who are shielding and cocooning. And in some instances, um, the staff and volunteers from Clare are the only ones they'll see on a weekly basis, which is crucial to maintain their mental health. We also, you know, help with utilities, uh, help paying gas bills, help paying electric bills, and so on. And we don't neglect our advocate advocacy advocacy role that is crucial for social workers. You know, people still have housing issues. People still um, have issues around getting access to social services, physio and OT. They still have issues around getting um, help with benefits advice and so on. That doesn't go away just because we're in the middle of coronavirus epidemic. We recognised earlier on, early on, that. An early intervention around emotional support was going to be crucial for the future for our, our, our older people. Um, and we knew that by being proactive at the beginning and maintaining that contact off the, on the phone, that we were providing a service um, and we were phoning people on a weekly basis and in some cases more often dependent on the need. But what we did notice was at the beginning, people were phoning us only if they needed help and assistance with a practical um, need. They weren't phoning us to talk about their emotional health or their mental well-being. But by week two or three, we recognised that because we had been proactive in the start in maintaining the contact, the people were beginning to open up to us. And they were really you know, happy that we had provided that space and encouragement for them to be open about their concerns and their anxieties and their worries and their fears and over the phone. And now we've, we're at the stage where Maybe phone calls would have taken 20 minutes. Now people are phoning us for anything up to an hour as the weeks have gone on and their anxieties have increased. So we're recognising that emotional and psychological support is crucial at this point to the extent that we've um, we've, we've encouraged our Talking Therapies at Home service, um, which we piloted last year, which was a home-based counselling service for some of our older people. And we're now extending that to um, phone contact. Can we move on to the next page, please? The, uh, this is the last slide. I know Avery's keen that we keep it to five minutes, but um, from the emotional support and guidance that we were providing, we recognised that mental stimulation was going, as another huge need for our older people. And again, we adapted our service to meet that. We had a lady who was very active um, in her local community, attended community groups three times a week, very, you know, up and out every morning. And we phoned her the second week at about half 10, quarter to one in the afternoon, half 12, quarter to one in the afternoon. And she was still in her dressing gown and she was still in her night clothes. And we, we were probing what was wrong. And she said, well, get up for what? What is there to actually get up for? I'm tired of the television. I'm not watching the news. There's nothing for me to get out of bed for. And we recognised that we really needed to look at mental stimulation and how we could um, encourage that with our older people. So at the start, we did simple things like texted people riddles, um, which was really good because it you know, encouraged competition. And they were trying to see who could get the answers before each, each other. That extended to us sourcing and um, distributing things like word search books, mindfulness coloring books, Sudoku. We distributed potted plants for people to have them to nurture and look after. And this week we've kind of moved on again because we've recognized that encouraging hope is going to be a huge uh, next step for our older people and, and also keep them mentally stimulated. So we're, we're um, distributing um, jars that people can put little notes that they're thinking of, of things that they want to do post coronavirus lockdown so that they can have a look at those and maybe you know do them when everything gets back to normal. So again, mental stimulation was crucial for us. We pride ourselves on Claire at taking time out with people and building relationships and building trust. And I think maintaining our core values 
of person-centered relationship-based social work has been maintained um, throughout all the adaptations and the innovations that we've had to go through over the last few weeks. And I'm very proud to say that we've done that. And lastly, I would say, as all voluntary organisations and charitable organisations will say is, to quote, paraphrase, whatever Elton John, we're still standing. You know, there's a lot of charities and there's a lot of organisations in the voluntary sector that won't be as lucky um, post coronavirus. Um, and we have to realise that they're a vital part of providing a service um, to the community that they're they're based in. As I said before, we had queries and, and worries that there wouldn't be any funding for some staff at the end of March. That's been extended till the end of September. So we know that we have two posts secured, one of which is the social worker, but that doesn't give you much time to be developmental in a, in a community organization. So I hope that's been useful. I'm happy for any questions and thank you very much for your time. Greta, thank you so much for that. That was really fantastic. I mean, there was so much in there and so much um, so much a picture of what it's like practicing at the moment and, and being out in the community. Um, one of the things I think, and I'd maybe when we get to the panel, uh, uh, section, I think something to think about out of that was uh, it was particularly stuck out with me. That was a bit about duplication, because um, I think that was a that was a big theme there again around all the government responses around whether we should go local or whether we go central. And you can you can still see it in the you know the big discussions about testing and, and even tracing, but also I mean again I think this thing about voluntary and community sector survival during the period and and whether those resources. Would, could have been better harnessed. So maybe that's something we'll come back to. And again, if you've got thoughts out there, um, you know, please do use the the, the chat box to uh, to keep keep in touch with us there. Um, okay, so I'm going to move along again to our final presentation, and I'm very pleased to welcome Eamon Macrolane. Eamon's a, an assistant service manager uh, in hospital social work in the Belfast Health and Social Care Trust. Um, we're really grateful to Eamon and the Trust for committing to today's webinar. When we were planning the webinar, this was exactly the type of social work voice we wanted to include, but we were very mindful of the pressure that everyone's been under, and it could have been just one ask too many. So we're really pleased that we've all been able uh, to make this happen today. So Eamon, uh, over to you. Um, first of all, just to say thanks, Avery, for inviting me. Um, I think it's a wonderful project and I think it's an opportunity for us all to sit back and reflect on the pandemic and how it has impacted on our profession, but also on the wider scale. Um, as a trust, I feel that there's been definitely a lot of challenges. Um, there's been innovative practice and we'll go into that a bit more shortly, but it's just to really offer our thanks for um, involving us today. Next slide, please. Not to start off on the wrong foot, but I suppose, you know, we have all been faced with challenges with COVID-19. Um, across the board, all trusts, including Belfast Trust, needed to change um, to meet the demands of the COVID-19. It was a different demographic of patient coming on to um, our wards. They were presenting with similar challenges that we had always worked with and dealt with, but we also had new challenges. Um, and I suppose on a wider scale, seeing across the water, coming across from China, across Europe and into the UK, there was definitely going to be multiple challenges that we were trying to learn, but due to the rapid evolvement of um, COVID-19, it was a struggle at times to always keep on top of what was the right avenue, what was the right way to go. Um, the hospital social work role was heavily entrenched within discharge planning. We also have our statutory responsibility in terms of adult safeguard and child protection. Those numbers did decline, and that was a worry for us, you know, because we were conscious that abuse still happened. And so we were constantly working with key stakeholders, either within the hospital sites or there in the community, to let us know to be more vigilant, to be more aware. Um, and there was maybe different hidden challenges in terms of safeguarding that may not be always apparent, but maybe there for them to address and for us to then investigate. Um, in terms of the hospital social work room, it changed dramatically. Um, our hospital sites, um, we have nine hospital social work teams across Belfast Trust. Um, and within the Matter Hospital site and Belfast City Hospital site, um, they were most affected in terms of staff dynamics. We needed to depreciate with the anxiety of staff, understand it, acknowledge it, 
work together as a collective leadership to acknowledge the fact that COVID was here and how would we work best in a person-centered practice, compassionately, but also safely. Um, and I suppose that was all working within the realms of the unknown of COVID-19. Um, BCH, as we can see later on in, in terms of how we evolve as a trust, um, turned into our own nightingale, and that was reflective of what was happening within England. Um, that in itself proved difficult because a lot of wards in terms of minimising cross-infection did not feel that it was appropriate to have social work staff on the wards. Um, we worked together as a team. Multidisciplinary working is key to working with out well within a hospital setting. Um, we eventually agreed, firstly on our matter site, that it would be on a needs basis and social work still have a key role to play as part of that multidisciplinary team. Um, we went back onto the wards. We spoke with um, patients. It was difficult, and, and I suppose it was difficult to, to communicate um, using communication boards, working with um, speech and language to try and develop different ways and techniques of exchanging information and also receiving it. Proved to be difficult initially, but I feel it would definitely evolve with that as time has went on. Um, Social workers in general were very worried. Um, we're members of the public as well. So in listening to the media and I suppose all of the concerns that were stemming from the media, we were trying to manage that, um, address things that are not undermine it in any which way. We have different techniques in place in order to manage anxieties within the trust. We tried our best to put different techniques in place. Um, but I suppose we've never dealt with this before. It's a global pandemic, um, and that in itself has been challenging. Um, as I said earlier, I suppose from a community perspective, home visits, as Greta has alluded to, it was difficult for social workers to undertake their regular home visits. Um, they were having to deal with the more crisis-driven approach, um, but that was done in a very systematic way, and also, again, in kind of key stakeholders to help identify a vulnerable in the community in order for them to do that. We again linked in with both the doctors, nurses, OTs on the war, on the wards to see who we needed to see and who that we need to see um, urgently. And it's definitely again evolved and working well currently. Next slide, please. I suppose what has changed and what has worked well, there have definitely been positives out of adversity. Um, and I suppose the matter in particular has evolved from an acute site um, to a point where it's our, it's our COVID site. Um, that has definitely been challenging, but the MDT staff work well together. Um, in terms of the Nightingale, we know more recently it's been stepped down, but it hasn't went away because we can appreciate as a trust that it's definitely going to be needed potentially in the future, in the coming months. Um, to address the more seamless approach for a patient and service user's journey from an acute site to the community. We understood that we needed to create beds on the acute site to take in the, the, the sickest patients. Um, there were patients who then could go home or could go to um, back to care homes, but just not right now um, for different issues. You know, they may have been still COVID positive, but not but just medically optimized. So that needed to be factored into how we work with our domiciliary care providers and also the care homes. There was different um, avenues of discharge planning like that. The community um, step-down centre, better known as Ramada, um, has been set up in order for the trust to best utilize uh, patients who are medically fit, um, but still need some work um, in terms of for their rehabilitation, they may not be able to go home because their vulnerable partner or relatives are shielding um, until such times where we are able to test that person again to make sure that the COVID positive status is now a negative. Um, it also allowed us to, I suppose, offer further periods of convalescence. We haven't worked with COVID before and to have that person-centered approach with um, patients and service users not on a, an acute site was a really good environment to work with them within. Back to I suppose what Greta was saying earlier and what Dave had said, we appreciated that there was a high level of isolation in the community, there was a high level of 
vulnerable patients and our vulnerable services and their families in the community. Um, the trust and partnership with key stakeholders in the community developed the Community Coordination Centre. And I suppose, hopefully, Greta, um, it helped sew together a lot of the issues that you've highlighted earlier in terms of duplication of work, um, identification at an earlier juncture, reducing risks, um, meeting those basic needs for people in the community, um, bringing in, I suppose, the voluntary, um, independent and statutory sector as one, which I hope has worked well. Um, there's positive feedback um, in relation to that. On the hospital side, we felt that there was a, a clear deficit, I suppose, in the fact that patients couldn't be visited by their families. This was leaving them isolated at a time where they were most vulnerable. We were working with them as professionals, but we weren't their family. You know, we wanted to be person-centered, and that's so we were innovative um, in a few different things. Initially, we opened up what was called the Rainbow Room. It's an opportunity and a safe space for staff to come recuperate um, and to have that bit of reflective practice that they may need. They've had a really hard day on the wards and can come down and spend some time um, just with their peers in terms of trying to de-stress, make sure that they are safe to go back on the wards and offer the best service to um, the patients. We linked in with the Trust Bereavement Coordinator, Heather Russell, who in tandem with an army of really, um, probably really good volunteers um, who have a wealth of experience from across the health perspective, come on board to help support the social work team um, and for us to also help support them in offering bereavement support. We developed a family liaison role um, what that looked like is when someone came in, we linked them with the family to get a better pen picture of that person. They weren't just a, a sick person with COVID. We wanted to know their, their legs, the dislikes. We laminated um, a person-centered patient profile and put it above their beds. Um, when the doctors and nurses who were in full PPE and their identity was sort of being um, stripped back, we tried to give the person in the bed a bit more of an identity as well, a bit more of a personal approach. That has worked well. Um, we also then purchased quite a lot of iPads. Um, technology is our new friend. Um, it, it's a way we feel that every profession is probably moving forward. As social workers, we are great communicators. And I suppose what this has done is really amplified our communication skills. We were able to advocate for the patients and service users with their family. We were able to do Skype calls um, and make sure that someone who potentially it was their um, last conversation they were maybe having with their family that was done in a dignified manner um, and it really allowed the compassion approach to come across but also for the, the person and the, the relatives to really have a, a strengthened connection um, when that person or when they couldn't visit. Um, so that was a really positive outcome of this. The bereavement support was uh, done on many levels. It could have been a very practical approach People aren't allowed to really they attend the crematorium at this point in time. They aren't allowed to um, register the death as you normally would with City Hall. So it was to break that down and offer practical advice in a period of time where their relative was in a state of disarray. And it was to sort of offer that bit of focus. Um, it was also then to do follow-up calls with relatives to make sure that they were okay and that we were identifying potentially any vulnerabilities with relatives who the patient on the ward may have been the person to do a lot of the um, shopping, um, management of finances within the house. And at that point, we were able to signpost that relative to a lot of different services as well. So from a hospital perspective, with our limited abilities in terms of being community facing, became a lot more community facing. We outreached into the community a lot more. We did do referrals through our community coordination center. Um, we offered a high level of support from the Rainbow Room. Um, one, one bit of a practical um, and emotional perspective that we did do, we linked in with the Arts Council, who developed hearts. Um, the heart, one heart went in with the person who was deceased, and one heart was then sent out with um, a brave impact to the relative. And relatives felt that there was a, some level of comfort there, that they had a connection with their relative who um, they could not see. Um, so we felt that was a really nice thing to do. Um, we also sent out um, forget-me-nots, which turns out to be the flower now attached with COVID-19. Um, we offered those sympathy cards, but what we had tried to do was link in, be that conduit between the relative and the ward to get maybe a, a few last 
Um, it was comments from the nursing team who cared for their relative um, during their last hours. It was then put into the Forget Me Now card and sent out as well as the bereavement pack. So I think from a trust perspective, we were trying to be as compassionate as possible. Um, we were very dynamic in how we were working. And I suppose as a social work manager, I'm very proud of how the social work team have changed. Um, as I said earlier, we have promoted a seamless journey from an acute site home or an acute site to their whatever destination pathway that that person may have. Um, there's been a development growth in our skill set. We can all add to our toolbox um, as we develop as practitioners, and I feel that like communication has definitely been key. Um, we are addressing issues like we spoke about earlier in terms of people who may have hearing impairments or visual impairments. We're working with um, key disciplines and to try and address those deficits at an earlier juncture, but we can only sort of address them as they come up. Um, one of them would be communication through a mask. Um, that's difficult across all boards and it's something that we're working upon. Next slide, please. What have we learned as social workers? I suppose what I've learned as a manager and as a social worker, we are a very adaptive profession. We are able to adapt well. We're innovative and compassionate. We have developed a very can-do approach from the hospital perspective and also the community perspective. When we initially raised um, that we would need to change as a service to meet the ever-growing needs of the hospital sites and the community site, there was not one no heard. It was, yes, we will do. We will help whatever which way we can from all the social workers, which was absolutely lovely to see as a manager and as a social worker. Um, I, I feel that we are um, able to amplify our skills and our value set, and we, we are compassionate practitioners, and I feel that that has definitely shone through. There's been a definite um, integrated response between the trust and our community um, colleagues, which has been fundamental to being person-centered and meeting the best needs of that person and patient. Um, and I suppose just in summary, in order to sort of move forward in what we have found, the technology is going to be key. COVID's not going to go away for a while yet. We all need to adapt further. Um, there needs to be a period of time to reflect now to understand what has happened in the past uh, few months and what we need to learn to develop as a future service and as a profession. Um, back to you, Avery. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eamon. I mean, again, I mean, so much in there and so much about what's been going on. And I mean, again, no disrespect to other colleagues in health and social care, but I think what that says is what a lot of us know that social workers have been doing work in, in the heart of that, uh, of what's been going on. Some of it is a little bit un, unseen and there have equally been huge uh, challenges in there. Um, the other thing is, I think I'm grateful for your remarks as you went into that, because I think, you know, the, there's a little bit of a question about this is whether is this too early to be trying to do the learning and i i really don't i think we came to the conclusion that it wasn't um and i, and I think if we regard even today as a bit of an action learning set you know this is like a, we're trying to pick early signals and you know there's there's questions there on folk asking you know uh you know already you know what what do social workers think is going to change for the future you know that's coming from social workers and service users in 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 the chat um just want to quickly um, introduce uh, uh, Mandy Cowden, who's a professional advisor with Social Care Council and on their workforce development, uh, and also Martina Jordan, who's professional officer for Baz for Northern Ireland, um, as well as doing a, a range of independent work um, around restorative justice, restorative practices. Um, I'd just like to say a personal thank you to uh, Martina, partly for supporting this today and, and making this happen, but also to acknowledge the support she's been given to many social workers during the COVID pandemic. Um, so again, we've got a little bit of time here and I wanted to just try and try and see if we can get different perspectives and different ideas and you know and, and from our, our panelists. Um, I suppose uh, one of the things I wanted to pick up on right away was um, and I mean, again, it's been very, very much in the news again around action uh, in mental health action plan and stuff like that. And I mean, there's cues and stuff. I think that you've, you've been, uh, everybody's been saying, you know, what, what do you see as some of the mental health challenges uh, going forward? Maybe start with Greta. Um, I think that I mean, there's going to be huge mental health implications, specifically for older people. We're talking to at the minute. 
there, you know, we work with people that are socially isolated and lonely in normal times. Um, but it's nearly been over the last few weeks. The idea of prolonged isolation for the older people that we support is causing a lot of anxiety and a lot of fears and a lot of worries. Um, and I alluded to the fact that, you know, phone calls would have maybe taken 20 minutes are now taking an hour because people are needing a lot of time to um, be heard and they want to be reassured. And that's something that we're capturing because we've started a survey um, that's been uh, accredited to the National Office of National Statistics. Um, and we're going to do that. We did it, we started two weeks ago and we're going to carry that on right through the period of um, cocooning for older people that we're supporting because we reckon it will help um, post COVID to address some of the mental health services that will need to be set up for older people at that, that when this is all over. Some of the some of the themes that are coming out are around fear of what they're hearing on the television and the news, around anxiety about not being able to see friends because a lot of them that we support don't actually have any family. Um, and there's some other issues around dementia as well, people forgetting why they're they're um, being cocooned or shielding and so on. And we have to mm -hmm. kind of reassure them constantly. But the other thing um, that I really want to point out as well, this has an impact on, on social workers and on staff who are supporting um, in, in our case the older people that we work with because when you're hearing constantly um, stories that are of people who are feeling low and depressed and anxious, um, we have to recognise that we have to support the workforce as well. So whilst everybody maybe is sort of concentrating on the service users, there has to be some mechanism in the future that we have to start looking and addressing probably now of supporting the workers who have been involved in all this throughout the, the mm -hmm. coronavirus. Mm -hmm. uh, Eamon, could I, could I get you in there just on, on a separate issue, just to pick up on, um, uh, you know, we talked about some of the communication challenges, you know, um, and um, Amanda Burgess had raised that in the chat about the difficulty of, uh, particularly for people with learning disability and, and autism, and maybe some of your experiences of that recently, you know, in, in, in your ho in hospital setting. Yeah, it, it definitely has been difficult. Um, and I suppose what we've tried to do as social workers is link in with um, experts within the field, other psychologists, learning disability social work teams, in order to try and ascertain they the person who's with us on the ward may have been open to that, that person's social worker team in the community for a while they would allow us to know how best to work with that person um, so we'd get a better pen picture we would then work with maybe speech language team in order to develop techniques to exchange the information that we wanted to exchange but also then glean the information that we need in order to develop a really robust assessment. Um, risk assessment is key. Um, to sort of touch on what Greta had spoke there and about mental health as well. Across the board, what we're sort of finding, not with every patient, but there's a, an increase in delirium. Um, people who have an acute delirium, we don't know if it's fully linked with COVID-19, but then we're trying to factor that into someone's discharge plan and are they safe to live at home again? So we need to look holistically um, about how we communicate, how do we get that best information? And at times we're also looking at the Mental Capacity Act as well. And do we need to implement that? Um, so in sort of the summary of that, Avery, yes, we, we link in with all the key stakeholders, family, um, colleagues in the community, um, stakeholders within the, the hospital say, just to sort of um, arm ourselves with an arsenal that we will be best placed to get that information and exchange information around. But mm -hmm. we do face our difficulties. It is a scary sight to see someone in full PPE. Um, what we try and do is also put our names on PPE. Um, we, um, there's different techniques, there's different um, scrubs that can be used. Um, that aren't as um, clinical as the police scrubs that we see. Um, so there's different techniques that we do use. Okay. Um, I just want to go to Martina and Mandy's rejoined us, which is fantastic because the next thing I wanted to ask was a question from the audience, um, you know, was around, um, you know, how, how have BASWA and, and Social Care Council been supporting social workers at, at this point, which kind of actually follows on from, from some of the stuff. Um, could I start with Martina? Sure. Um, can I just say, um, following on from what Eamon was saying about PPE, I think we need to remember social workers in residential childcare. And mm -hmm. we have had a lot of calls from members who are really concerned that children in distress, you know, about calming them down and reassuring them. And I mean, this is their home, they're a family. 
and social workers really struggling with the use of PPE with children who need to see their face, you know, so, uh, and social distancing, obviously, as well. So that's just another point. Um, but as well, as you can imagine, I've been really, really busy over the past uh, couple of months. We were kind of ahead of the game. Um, we first wrote a letter to um, the social work leaders, and I think it was about the 11th of March, expressing our, our huge concern about uh, the lack of or no PPA, and also the, the limitations regarding how social workers were to operate under under you know extremely stressful and difficult circumstances. Um, so I have, as a professional officer, I have been working mainly with um, with members. And when members come to me, it's because they can't speak to other people in, in their job or um, they're not feeling heard. So they're coming up to load. And most of the um, issues that have been coming to me is obviously uh, in the initial stages, people were expected to practice as normal without guidance or PPA. And people were really worried about the impact of the, of the virus on themselves, on their families. Some members are living with their parents who are who have had to isolate. So they were worried about bringing things into their home. They're also, and what has just blown me away, has been the commitment of social workers to, to service users throughout this pandemic. It's blown me away. It's actually, um, I've, I've really seen the values and ethics and morals of social work in practice over the day in day out over the past two months and I think we're really kind of coming back to what what our, our jobs really are I mean um they're they're obviously we're with their shoes but they're worried and, and yeah because social workers were telling me there was an exact in between homes and they're really concerned about bringing virus you know into uh homes and so we've had, a, you know, Greta, you were touched on mental health. I think we need to really think differently about how we support social workers, because I have had contact from a few members who um, actually have had to take sick leave. And in fact, I had a quite a distressing call with one member who was planning sick leave. Now, that should not happen. You know, she was planning, she wanted to ensure that her services were OK in her absence, but she could not cope. She just was, and it's not that she could not cope, she shouldn't be expected to cope with uh, the amount of work she has done and, and what she felt was a lack of support. So we've helped her three out. Now that these are, you know, I'm not speaking in a general way, but these are the cases who are coming, to, the, the members yeah. who are coming. To. So yeah. I mean, we have, we've done a lot of work with the, um, sorry, just to finish, the Health and Social Security Trust, we are board and trust, we have contact employers, we have, uh, provided, um, we uh, we were before the public, um, sorry, the uh, health committee, the North Nantes Assembly Health Committee. We um, give an awful lot of evidence to the committee about how social workers are working through this COVID-19, and you can access that by our, our website. We are providing support spaces for our members, and actually, um, for this next month, we we want non-members also to attend these support spaces, which are confidential. Uh, spaces for people to upload and just share what their thoughts and feelings are about what's happening and cross fertilize good practice and ideas. Uh, we have put out a series of, of videos updating uh, members on progress they've made or uh, you know emerging issues. Mm -hmm. uh, we launched our Let's Talk podcast, which was brilliant with Women's Aid. Um, just and we're going to continue with the series of podcasts uh, working with with community organisations um, and, and trying to support them. And obviously, we've, we've been in contact with the Minister for Health as well. We've written letters saying that we are, you know, we really need to protect our social workers and their service users. So, to summarise, we've been very busy, Avery, but that's what we want to do. We want to be busy. We're very yeah, we're, we're, we're very tight for time here. I just wanted to get Mandy in there. I mean, I suppose it also, I mean, Social Care Council in some ways, mm -hmm. again, has had to work in a different way and, and try and you know, support the workforce. And again, you know, I mean, again, my email inbox had yesterday had social care council stuff again about kind of trying to generate resources and trying to think into some of these issues. If you wanted to maybe just touch on some of the highlights that are around there. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I suppose we we have um, been on a journey, really. I think initially it was about very practical um, information um, you know, people, students who were due to qualify, people who were AYE, really very, just really trying to provide a, a, 
a central base where people could find out about how they just continue on with, with their practice. But we also were very clear we needed to look at what resources needed to be shared with people. And Social Care Council have a really good website, We've got an e-learning zone. And I suppose you know we are the, the place where registrants um, um, will go to. And, and we knew that we had amongst our registrants people with a lot of skills and a lot of um, experience that we needed to share. So we were doing things like the the um, conversations about bereavement was one of the first ones, and that was done in partnership with social workers um, from across all the trusts. We've, we've developed resources around shielding and isolation, again, done in partnership with community organisations. And, and our most recent one is about resilience and, and well-being for social care workers and workers. So um, those are very practical resources, but I think what, what we're really interested in to going forward is, you know, all the things that we've talked about that either amplify what we do, whether it's social work or social care, all the good things, you know, what we are as a profession, how we take that forward, doing a little bit of navel gazing really and thinking, right, you know, what is it about us that we want to continue on with? Um, and, and that's our hope that, you know, we want to gather stories about the social care registrants that we have, yeah. but also yeah social workers so I mean I would encourage people what we want to do is gather all the good stuff and oh. think this is the things we want to take forward I, I'm getting I'm getting a cue from our technical support to wrap up but in good in good Belfast local engagement partnership fashion we've overrun um, what I think this is really I'm really pleased we've done this because I think it's opened up so much more than we could actually do today um, we do have a record of your questions and I want to come back to them oh actually the idea I want to put out there and people are involved with our local engagement partnership if there's an appetite to do this again and kind of maybe revisit you know what we've done today and kind of have more of a discussion I'd like to think about that I just really do need to end with some thanks I think to, to Dave Greta Eamon Mandy and Martina for putting themselves out there and, and doing this today um, to Amanda Stephanie and Jane at Basma for making the tech stuff happen this wouldn't have happened without you guys thanks very much uh, Belfast Trust, Claire, Action for Children, Social Care Council and Basra for supporting this webinar. Again, without that kind of organisational backup, we wouldn't have done this today. Um, also, big shout out to some of my fellow uh, Belfast Local Engagement Partnership Steering Group members, Denise Withers, who you saw, but also Anne Purse and Sandra McCarry from the Trust and Jack Gilliland, a stalwart of our steering group. And you know, a really big thank you to all of you you're dropping off now because you want to go but there were 69 people on this webinar at one point which i think is a remarkable achievement in the time we had to turn it around and, and kind of make this happen so really i found that intensely interesting as so many things i'd like to be doing and we haven't got the time to do but thank you very much and we'll maybe be back to you with uh maybe doing something like this again so good afternoon and stay safe bye for now